Yes, Although what I, what I will say is having had just over a week and a half of COVID, I don't think that was as traumatic as having to sit through season 20. Hello and welcome to Talking About Who. Uh, we've gone from 20 to 2, 2 to 20. Look, I'm doing the actual Caroline Paul fluff from the pilot. Um, we are going to be doing season 20 um, in Three, maybe four parts. It'll all be confirmed. Um, I am Paul or P-Bell. Like, subscribe, share, whatever kids do these days. And I'm joined by... Hello, it's James. And hello, it's Jason. It's true, that's a genuine fluff. She's talking about the, the, the child position of the John Smith and the common men. It's like, you wouldn't celebrate going from two to 20, would you? <laughs> Unlike us, we are very much celebrating going from two to 20. Oh, we're loving this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we kick off with Doctor Who and the Ark of Infinity. Um, I'm going to say, actually, um, if at some point during this you hear me hacking up, it's, it's the outgoing of COVID. So, so bear with, dear, dear viewer. So, um, it's, it's the quality of the stories at all. <laughs> it, it's, it's thoughts of the Ergon making me churn. So who is introducing the Ark with a, with a C? Okay. <laughs> oh, no, I will, it's, it's very, it's very Gallic. I like, I like, I like, I like that it's Ark. Ark. Uh, so it's the return of Omega and Tegan, uh, which prompts a trip to Amsterdam and a discovery of traitor on Gallifrey. That's it. That's all I've got to say about the story, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I was settling in there for a really long intro to it there from you. No, so so we have, so um, yes, we have the return of Omega and uh, we start with Nyssa and the Doctor and the TARDIS and something tries to come through and take over the Doctor. And meanwhile, you've got a slightly different story where you've got... Um, is it Tegan's nephew, cousin? It's her cousin. Yeah, who's uh, backpacking, sort of sleeping in a crypt in Amsterdam and uh, stumbles across Omega in this crypt and his, whatever they, the chicken head thing. Yeah, the, <laughs> what's it the chicken head thing. <laughs> it looks like, like a mutant chicken. Um, I, I miss the bubble guards. I mean, I, last time Omega had those lovely little sort of bubble guards with the crab claws and and things, and now he's got these uh, not ogrons. Um, what are they called? Ergon. Called? It's the ergon. It's the yeah. ergon. Yes. Uh, yeah. So Omega's back and trying to take over the Doctor's body. Is trying to is after his bioprint. Um, he's, he's assisted by an unknown helper, mm -hmm. Omega is, who sounds like Michael Goff and has the silhouette of Michael Goff, <laughs> and who turns out to be Michael Goff. It's quite the shock. I mean, Michael Goff has just got one of those really recognisable voices. <laughs> and you hear, I mean, he's there with the pen at the beginning, and he's like, oh, you know, we must be discovered. And yes, and even speeded it up. Know. Even speeded up, you can tell it's Michael Goff. There's no getting away from it, is there? <laughs> and the, the, the awful, just to bring onto the, 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 the books of the era, where they used to just have really nasty cut-out photos, it is... Michael Goff holding the gun at the doctor on the cover of the book. So were you wondering who could be this mystery accomplice on Gallifrey? There are a couple of clues out there for, for you two. If you just, just, just wheel out. I'm surprised. That wasn't a hardback. That's why you're not waving it around, isn't it? Do you know what? My, 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 I, I think the majority of season 20 must be buried at home. I've definitely got Maudrin with that sort of surly picture of Peter on the cover. And I've got, I've got two enlightenments. I think there's a. I'll, I'll go and get. I'll get the King's Demons out. I've definitely got one of those in the other room. Um, the, the the covers of this era are pretty. The photo things are nasty. Um, but anyway, back to the actual episode. Um, I'm going to say my positive here, which becomes a negative quite quickly. <laughs> um, my positive is the first episode. I love uh, Peter and Sarah. I love the, the Fifth Doctor and Nissa, and I'm like. 
crikey, this is a really good duo. They really work well together. They want to be together. She's she's slightly um she she does the disapproval thing of there's a lot more maintenance than all that. She does all that without being a shrew. And it's it's just a nice dynamic that 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 they've got together. And so it's absolutely crushing when Deacon rocks up the week after. It's like, oh God. <laughs> I the, face she, at the, the doctor's face at the end of the story says that for us as well. <laughs> well do, you, do, right. <laughs> but do, do you know, I mean, equally, the, Tegan has whinged incessantly since she got in there that she wants to go to go back to the airport because she's an air hostess and she has an amazing job. You know, And then the second she can get back, she's back and like, well, hang on, I thought you were an air hostess. She's like, I got the sack because you were crap. <laughs> I mean, what... What 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 is she? What is she? she she's like, oh god, she she whinged because she wanted to go home, and 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 she doesn't want to be there, and she moans when she's back. So, I just I that's the first thing to absolutely hate Arkham Infinity for, and it's not Johnny Burns' fault because you know it's John Nathan Turner's fault for having a a love of Tegan, but oh gosh, if the rest of the story had just been Doctor Who and Nissa. I, I think that would have helped. And Nessa gets some lovely stuff to do in the bits where she tries to rescue him. And, you know, she's she's quite feisty and she's got a lot to do. And I just think, oh, we, we, this, we, this is what works. There's that lovely scene at the beginning where he fixes the scanner so it's got audio, but they're in space. <laughs> it's just nothing to hear. He's just like, well, I'll fix that. It's just like... Well, if the audio was working, he could have got tulips from Amsterdam played for him when they finally do get there. Because if we don't already know it's in Amsterdam, if we get that reinforced to us at least twice in the story as we go along. Yeah, so, it's in the, so that's in the first episode and then it's in the last episode. And that's what um, Omega gets distracted by on the organ. It's tulips. So, but that, you're right. It's in the very first episode. You hear the music playing in the background. But it has to be in Amsterdam because it's below sea level, and that's how how <laughs> Omica's machine works. So he didn't think I'll have an underwater basin. We thought, oh, I think Amsterdam's quite picturesque. I don't know, bit of weed, a prostitute. I can I can have a good time here, and I can also steal the doctor's body print. What what's what's to lose? It does feel a bit odd, though. I mean, this was this is another one of John Nathan Turner's likes of. And, and of doing isn't it but taking Doctor Who away for a bit of location filming abroad mm. somewhere what is the actual purpose of even having done it for this story other than you know you could have you could have contrived that plot point for the Ark of Infinity around just about anywhere in all reality so did it really need to be Amsterdam did it really benefit from it they probably just wanted a, a you know a weekend away I, do you know what I think I think actually I don't mind Doctor Who turning up because because it is a bit strange that he usually ends up in London or the home counties, you know, he mm. very rarely pops the hull when it's being invaded. It's always London. Um, so I don't mind him going to Amsterdam. I think actually the, 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 the clever thing to do is that it's just that he's gone to Amsterdam. The, 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 the shoehorning of him, the reason is this, it's like, oh, don't need to. Just It's just where he's landed. He hasn't got to invade London because it's close to television centre. Um, you, you just get... Tegan in that sort of that that moment where she's wobbling around in the sort of space vortex where she goes Amsterdam. So that that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not it's not a highlight for anyone, is it? That when she's she's slopped back um, in the Matrix. Isn't she, she is in the Matrix. Very dodgy yeah. effect Matrix as well. This time out, it's fair to say. Um, you know, season 20, it's 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 an anniversary season, essentially. You know, I suppose on paper, it seemed like a really good idea to to bring back Omega in into the story. Um, it just feels so disconnected from the Omega that we that we'd already previously encountered in the three doctors. I mean, the, the, the thing is, with this with this whole season is, is JNT has decided to try and shoehorn as much. Sort of. Um, flashbacks or callbacks to previous stories as he can you know we've got returning characters which we'll talk about in other stories there's there's little um i think in this one you see nissa's dress from the black orchid um you you get these sort of like 
callbacks to previous stories or um, mentions of, of other things, which is fine. But I must say, I didn't notice how many there were until I started this rewatch. And then when you realise that that's what's going on, it does feel a little bit forced. <laughs> it's like, oh, we're just going to just going to call back to it to a story that none of the companions here are actually part of. Um, it, it, it's really odd. But it feels like they didn't, I don't know, it's missing something for me. I, I mean, obviously Stephen Thorne's voice for the, the part of Omega and obviously the, the stature of the, of the actor as well, you know, back in The Three Doctors. Um, you know, we, we bumble along not knowing it's Omega for um, a couple of stories as it goes, um, for a couple of episodes, I should say. But I don't know, it just feels... it. it there's nothing that associates it or connects it with me. And it could just have been any, any bad, big, bad villain that week that, that was along for the ride in this story. There, there really isn't any connection there for me. I think it's, um, I mean, JNT was kind of early door sort of master on the publicity and promo vibe. And I think it's quite a nice um, sort of contribution to say every single ish, every single story this, this season will contain something from the Doctor's past and it's going to be amazing because celebrating 20 years or two but the, and it's something that the new series has sort of hit itself on in the same sort of cycle really is that you can acknowledge the past and you can have elements that come through but the second you feel that you need to live off the past or it becomes it, it arc of infinity isn't a story that that happens and omega fits the story because it's it's a story that's built around having to have omega in it and mm. There's the danger, isn't it? And I think that's when, you know, I'd imagine for the majority of casual viewers in 1983, I can't imagine there'd be many of them going, Christmas 72, wasn't there, wasn't there an Omega then with the three Doctors? Oh my God, he's back, I'm thrilled. It would only have been members of the Doctor Appreciation Society that have been like, wow, I've, I've read about this in a Target book. This is really exciting. And that's when you, you, you have to, I think, question where you're at as a producer are you making this as a show that works mm. for a general audience or are you starting to go i know it's got a fan base what do the fan base want you should never listen to the fan base if, if the think, fan base want it they'll write it themselves i think anything that includes like um flashback images you know sometimes when the doctor's having his mind read or you, you know and you see previous doctors and you just get like clip you know very short Short things. I think that works. I think you're right. When you labour on the history of it, when you when you're sort of like, and here's another reference, and here's another reference, and now we're going to bring another character back. In this season, that actually weighs it down for me. Um, more so in subsequent stories, you know, to bring Omega back is is fine. You know, he is he is one of the greatest time lords, and and we you know he's referenced a number of times throughout you know new and and old who but to bring him back because it's an anniversary season even though this isn't an anniversary special it's just like it's the 20th season so we're going to do lots of stuff to remind people of our history it it, it, it plays second fiddle to 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 what should be you know in in the th in the three doctors, Omega was a really substantial villain, whereas here it, it, he's not. And also, yeah. there's no there's no link back to it visually either. So it's almost like bringing the Daleks back and completely redesigning them so they don't actually look at anything like the Daleks. And I wouldn't say you have to actually be, you know, completely faithful to it, because you're quite right. The, the casual viewer wouldn't know that there was an Omega story 10 years ago. But at the very least, I think to bring to bring the, that character back and at least keep some design reference or at least the costume or the, the sort of look and feel a little bit more like it was back in the 70s, um, with a, obviously a modern, a modern twist on it, potentially, um, I think, again, would have been for me, I think would have made it, um, uh, I think would have made it a closer link. I'd have perhaps felt more connected to the fact that it's Omega and not just another bad monster. Well, the James Atchison mask is incredible. He has the disco cape, that's great, but he has the, the very iconic 
helmet, whereas the new one's got strange flashing lights in his head, and he's sort of preempting the Silurians and the sea. He's got <laughs> he's got that kind of disco globe going on, and and it's it's not quite. I don't know. I suppose it, there's nothing wrong with the design. It's just not not. No, it's as just good. beige. It's just quite beige. And when you put when you put Omega then up against the Ergon in one of the scenes, it's like <coughs> it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work for me. You mean the mutant chicken? The, yeah, the mutant chicken. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but it, uh, Omega and the Ergon, they're like a little gay couple, aren't they? And then you've got <laughs> and you go, it's true. And you got you got Colin and Robin, they're another gay couple. This is like this is like who pride this is. Maybe. Maybe. They were in sleep, separate sleeping bags, we have to say, but you know. So separate sleeping bags, but it was, hearts were connected. Yeah. I mean, he slept with his boots on, so he was thinking about running out in the middle of the night anyway. So um, <laughs> it's just, it's just, oh, it, yeah. and, it, it's weird. And then you get to the Time Lords. And again, you know, obviously we've got Omega, so you've got to have the Time Lords in here somewhere. And again, this almost feels, again, like a very shoehorned in here in, into this story. Um, quite rightly so, but um, they jump, they, they come across really dull and drab, I'm afraid, on, on screen. There's just no, there's nothing visually or um, in, in the written form, anything quite exciting about their inclusion in this story. I think I, I th it's probably my best bit i think is when they're they're on gallifrey i think i think that you know you you've got the the three sort of main characters obviously you've got hedden who, who's the michael goff who's, who's the traitor but these three <laughs> they just <laughs> remind, um uh, i was thinking back to uh keeper of track and you know we got the three council the, the, the council members who were all really inept and you're just like, who who on earth would replace the, the keeper out of the three of them? And that's kind of what I think about these three. It's just like they're just, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't pick any of them to be the next uh president because they all just seem to be completely clueless. Yeah, I mean, there's some great actors in there, Elspeth Gray. Mm. There's, there's some great, you know, Len Lennox is a strange performance, but I mean there's some great, great actors in there. I don't know whether they've sort of turned up, seen the big co the big collars and the neon Gallifrey set, and thought, "Okay, mm. what, what? How do we go with this?" And you know, dear, dear Ron Jones hasn't 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 bothered to tell them what to do. It, it's a really sort of, I mean, it's funny because 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 Jericho is great because I think Paul Jericho is the castellan. I think yeah. both turns he does he gives incredible value to it, and and he I think he lifts a lot off, but. Colin is eating that scenery. He is mm. loving this. He's, he's, I think what we do is he call his pulling a darrow, isn't he? I think he's yeah. pulling a darrow because every scene he's in, there's a sort of element of, nah, mm, I mean, that's probably a bit more Kenneth Williams than Paul Darrow. <laughs> but I think he, Colin is absolutely in any scene, like, sorry guys, um, this, this, is, this is my scene, isn't it? This is, this is it. And it, I am it's bacon. funny. Yeah, he is. Um, it, 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 you mentioned about Nissa earlier on, so one of my my sort of notes that I had, one of my factoids is that originally there was supposed to be Leela on Gallifrey and they were supposed to be part of the adventure, but um, Louise Jameson couldn't come back for it. So they gave some of the, the action to Nissa, which is why Nissa like picks up a gun and starts shooting guards. Um, and she's much more gung ho, but I actually quite like, you know, and, and considering what's going to happen to Nissa and, you know, going forward, I actually quite like that version of Nissa where she's quite manipulative. She's quite sort of like, you know, she does spend a lot of time sort of stomping her heels and, and going, I demand to speak to someone and I don't, you know, but when she gets the gun out of the cabinet and she's like, right, you know, we, we're going for it. I don't. I like that bit. I like how she sort of defends the doctor. And you've got the doctor sort of like saying, no, I, you know, I, I need to, you know, need to be sacrificed to stop this from happening. Um, but yeah, it is, there is, a, I mean, there's, there is a line from Hedden when he says, you know, every time the doctor comes back, 
you know we treat him like a you know like a like a prisoner and it's like yes <laughs> every time he goes back to Gallifrey he's either shot at or arrested but yeah it just there's a, there's a couple of strange continuity because again it's I think you're making a continuity reference that sort of isn't helping anything and is probably drawing attention to a short so it's like I really must check up on my good friend Leela if she's still around somewhere. It's like, oh yeah, she's 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 on the south side of the planet this week. You might be able to see her. Um, and and there's a line I think I think um, elsewhere has a line of, oh well, you were asked to bring Romana back. Yeah, it's like, Rom- yeah well that that, that yeah. was a storyline that went nowhere in season season eighteen. So thanks for bringing that back, love. I mean, I don't know. Continu- continuity is a thing. You either you either rejoice in it or you you cringe with it. And I think there are those sort of clunks it felt if you said oh i must check my my dear friend leela because she i left her here and then all of a sudden then she comes in the old chamois leather and says wow doctor i'm back <laughs> that's that's a thing isn't it but if it's just yeah she's 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 gone fishing or something it's kind of like oh i'm sure she'd have made the effort after all this time to maybe come and check out and see what you're doing mm. Yeah, agree. Um, the visualization of Gallifrey as well, it's too homely. It's too, it's too nice. It's sort of too, you know, if you look back to um Deadly Assassin, you look back to um Invasion of Time, you know, this feels very, it's just not very inspired in its design, I don't think, either. The the sets or 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 the sort of, you know, obviously you've got the you've got the typical neck collar, the sort of you know the pieces mm. around the back, the head, the head pieces there. But other than that, it's all a bit pedestrian in its design approach. I feel. Well, they put um, inflatable chairs in the corridor and fountains and things. What do you want to know? It starts to look like a leisure centre. Exactly <laughs> what I'm trying to say there. I think. <laughs> yeah, but surely, as as like one of the most you know intelligent, sophisticated races of the whole galaxy, you haven't got to paint it all black like an emo. You can have nice things in corridors where you sit down and give people bio data printouts when they pass by and stuff. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I, it's funny because I, I can remember like having this on video, and I'd have been, I'd have been, I'd have been a younger kid then, I'd have been 14, something like that. I think I actually quite liked Ark of Infinity. Yeah, I think when I was younger. Yeah, I, agree. I think I in my my younger. my surly middle age I just look at it now and find it a bit tiresome uh, and and it's just because there's not a lot of depth to it and and and, and there's not a lot of cohesion um I mean episode four basically just breaks down into um we've saved up the filming allowance to go around Amsterdam let's have a run around the, the streets because we don't have to bother about dialogue and stuff we can just run yeah. up and down and show it off a bit just a lot of standing on bridges going, he's over there. <laughs> and then hearing someone scream and then Peter Davison with various bits of like green cornflakes stuck to his face, you know, as he... as he. And then the ultimate demise of Omega is so, is so over and done with in like 10 seconds. It's like, oh, there you go then, Beep, and you're gone. That's it. I mean, were I an indiscreet sort of person, I'd say it's quite funny because we've had a lot of people that have come to events that are in this story apart from, there are two notable exceptions that i'm going to mention maya who is the receptionist who was key point to put in the all that yeah her she wanted a massive old fee to come to an event i was like seriously you receptionist in arc of infinity i'm not sure i'm not sure you're at jody whittaker levels yet love i don't know um and um sadly um neil uh neil Dalglish, he, he, I spoke for quite a while about coming to an event and he's, he basically just said, you know what? I think it's the worst performance I've given in any production ever and I would rather not remember it at all. And I find that a little bit sad because I actually quite like Damon in this. I think I, think yeah. I like Damon. I think he's a good foil for Nissa within it. So I felt he sort of done himself. He has a good relationship with Nissa, doesn't he? They're, they're quite sort of eming, trying to get the Doctor free yeah I, I feel he he did himself a disservice with that but he he wouldn't, mm. he wouldn't be swayed he thought he'd done a bad 
a bad thing. And you know, I don't think it was that bad. I agree with you. I think it was actually one of the one of the one of the good performances in there. I think all the guest cast, in all fairness, you know, there's, there's quite a, the number of names in here. Um, I don't think anyone really gives a, a bad performance in this one. I don't think. I'm too polite to say whether I think anyone in this game a really bad performance. <laughs> I'm saying nothing. <laughs> I think it's sad that that Michael Goff's character head in, ends up being killed off. Mm. I think you know he, ultimately he's not a bad person. He just thinks, and again, I think that's I think that's something that could have been tapped into more. It, it, Hedden's not a villain. He 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 wants Omega, Omega back because he is the greatest Time Lord. You know he 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 want he's got loyalty to him, and he just gets killed off. You know he, he saves the Doctor from um, you know from his next regeneration essentially. Um, but I think there's so much that could have been made of this story, and I, and I feel it just gets really short changed um you know for the sake of, yeah, and I, I would have personally liked you know they could have got rid of all the amsterdam stuff and just focused on you know the desperation of heading to try and get omega back even though that could have put the universe at risk rather than running around bridges pointing and then running off down another street it, it, it's really it, it's a shame that nothing more was made of it do we feel but, that do we feel at this stage that um uh the, the the script editing or the commissioning of the scripts particularly when you get to stories like this that i don't think it's that strong script wise I'm, I'm i'm absolutely sure it's not johnny burns fault but the script in itself is is you could drive a bus through some of the plot holes in this one um, but do you feel that there's some responsibility borne to bear by the script editor when you get to a season like like this, where potentially some of these stories don't quite work? Hmm. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I know I know Eric would blame John, and John would blame Eric, and it's a it's a perpetual circle, isn't it? That 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 neither one of them would ever say, do you know what, that was a clunker, and that's that's my bad. Um, I mean, Johnny Burn. In honesty, I'm not a massive Traken fan and I'm not a huge Warriors of the Deep fan. So I think he might have been safe in terms of getting a, a, a script in on time and getting it. I'm always bemoaning people being safe rather than good. I mean, everyone should be safe. You can be safe and good. It's a little less if you're at home, kids. <laughs> um, but I don't know whether Johnny Byrne as, as a as a entity, I mean... Heartbeat was his, wasn't it? Look how many years that ran. That was very safe and dependable, folks. Um, I don't know to what extent he was a, an easy commission because of, of, of being able to do it. Mm. Well, because Dorothy, I think, especially in, into this point, because I know there was the, a lot of argument, wasn't there, that, that John didn't want writers that had done it before he was producer. He didn't like having David Fisher on 18 and all he didn't want people that had been with an older regime and it took a lot of sort of swaying to get Robert Holmes and things like that because he felt he should be moving forward but he felt Doctor Who should be moving forward by writing stories about characters from the past but with new people so it's kind of uh, um, so you do get a kind of run of new writers and, and, and not everyone's going to get it um, so I think I've gone really round the hills there, haven't I? I don't know. I don't know to what extent it's a producer saying, this is the sort of show I want, and to what point it's a, a script editor who should be saying, okay, that's the sort of show you want, but these are the sort of scripts that we need to be making. I, I think it's lost a bit of its identity at this point. I, I, I honestly think the show is... We know from, from later seasons that the, the show changed. You know, they... they played around with the format they they especially when you start looking at you know by the time you get to to sylve you know there's there's a lot you know it's very different to what it is what it is here and it's gone through lots of different sort of evolutions but i, I feel at this point it's 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 a little bit lost its way and 
the next season I feel is is stronger but this just feels like it's it feels indulgent I think that's the word I'm going to use it feels like you know they've got all of the they've, they've gone to a panel of who fans and just said right we're going to do a bit of a special season what do you think we should have and, and this episode has all you know I, I think I've explained this on a previous recording when I was collecting the VHS the ones I would always go for are the ones that had scenes inside the TARDIS because they that wasn't all the time the one that had a companion leaving or or coming on board and ones that had Gallifrey on them and this ticks all those boxes so this you know this this story a bit like yourself I watched a lot of times when I was younger now I watch it and I'm like, hmm, okay, that's 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 a story. Um, and, and although it ticks all those boxes for all the th different things, it's not a very triumphant return to Gallifrey. The scenes in the TARDIS you know, just at the beginning, really, uh, and then you've got the TARDIS console when they're when they're on um, Gallifrey, and the companion returning. Is Deacon <laughs> the doctor? Even the doctor's not chuffed with that at the end of the story. So you're kind of like, has it ticked any boxes? And maybe I am being a bit harsh, but no, I I'll agree with you. I think this was one I would, I would, I would have watched. I watched it. I w this is a season I would have watched on on first transmission. I've gone back and revisited a couple of the stories over the years. This is the first time I've sat down and actually probably watched season 20 in, in a while, I would say. Um, and it's interesting. I, I always thought of Arc of Infinity for me when I watched it. Yeah, but was, you know, great, we've got Omega back. We've got the Time Lords. I'm a bit like you on that one, James. You know, nods to the past for me were always great things to have in Doctor Who at that time. Um, because, of course, we didn't really have access to, to the past history of Doctor Who. So it was kind of nice to have these little nods. And, you know, 13-year-old me probably did enjoy Omega at the time. But I've got to say, like you, going back and re-watching it and re-evaluating re re this entire season, as we will do over the course of the next few videos, um, it is interesting how I think some of my perception of it has now changed. I've, I've just happened, just glanced down at the... I've, I've actually aged myself. I was only 11 when this came out on video. <laughs> <laughs> anyone who's worried about that at home um <laughs> so i think um actually and they're allowed to before we go to the score i think um heading when he gets shot and falls down it's a bit like jason after three pints in the bay there's a there's a flail there that's quite funny <laughs> <coughs> i'm saying nothing uh, where i'm saying nothing doing a head in that is doing our head in anyway Right, so do we have any exciting facts before we go to scoring? I, I can't, I can't uh, miss the black, so the dark they, web. To try and disguise the fact that Omega was back, um, it was it, he was listed as the renegade in the Radio Times to try and it's a good old JNT trick to try and uh, to try and cover that up. Uh, the only other thing I had was um, in the casting of Max. Um, Maxil, uh, Pierce Brosnan was was one of the the names in the in the frame for that. But the floor manager, assistant floor manager Lynn Richards, had seen Colin in Blake Seven and recommended him for for that role. So there we go. That was it. I'm just thinking how bloody difficult it'd be to get an autograph of Pierce Brosnan on a Rock <laughs> of Infinity cover. That's the I pity the Bond fans that want to get anything signed. Um, okay, so are we going to go for our scores and the draws? Who's going first on the arc with a C of infinity? Go on, Jason. No, after you, James. <laughs> You're waiting to see how stingy I'm going to be. <laughs> Just... <laughs> well, I'm not exactly going to be terribly generous myself. So after you, though, James. Uh, do you know what? It, it... <sighs> If you'd have asked me about this score uh, that 20 years ago when it, you know when I first watched it on VHS, it'd probably be a lot higher than it's going to be today. It, it, I don't know what it is. It's just not aged well. And I think 
weirdly, because we have been watching so much Who, you know, when we and we we have skipped from season to you know, we've we've gone from doctor to doctor and, and stuff. I've seen so many good stories that now when I come to score stories, I, I'm being much harsher than I would have been just casually going, I'm gonna watch this this story. Um, you know, and we've just watched season two, and I know, you know, some of those stories we, we we didn't agree on, but a lot of them we did. And I think we're starting to get a sense of what benchmark for a good story is. And, and as I said, this to me should have ticked all those boxes, but doesn't. And I and I'm reluctantly, and I and I do kick myself for this, I, I'm gonna give it a four. Because I I, I just I don't even think it gets to the average point. I thought you were going to fire the episode then. You sounded a bit like Alan Sugar and reluctantly, I'm no, going, you're, you're just fired. Part, <laughs> just part of me thinks that, you know, it should be like a seven or an eight because it was a story that I I did enjoy when I was younger. But it, 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 it pained me to watch this. I, I just sat there going... I want it to be better than I want it to be as good as I remembered it was, and it wasn't. So yeah, it's a four. I'm like that whenever I meet Jason. <laughs> oh, that's rude. <laughs> okay, I'll take over the scoring then at this point. So James, you've reassured me I'm not actually up on the wrong tack here, I feel. But okay, um, I haven't really had an awful lot of good things to say about this uh, story already as we've come through the review of this one. And perhaps potentially, you know, I'm being a little harsh. There are some good, there are some good parts to this. Um, I think the ambition of, you know, taking it off to Amsterdam and doing all those sort of nice arty shots of them running around the city was, was, a, was a great thing to do. Um, but, you know, essentially, you know, you've got an old villain coming back. You've got start of the 20th anniversary season. It should have been a lot better than it was. Um, you know, I've tulips from Amsterdam coming out of my ears while we're watching that. And I can't get that bloody song out of my head now. There are some standout guest cast i think you're right i think the doctor and nissa were, were working really well at the time did we need tegan to come back was it just a publicity stunt she left at the end of the previous season to come back in this one um you know there are some good things but there are an awful lot of bad things about this story that i don't really like and re-watching re it as i've already said has has allowed me, I think, to reevaluate this season in, in a slightly different way. So um, coming back to my score, I'm not quite as low as James on this one. Um, I've given Arc of Infinity five. Oh. You know, he'd given it a four and then he waited to hear what James had scored it and then he's given it a five so he looks a bit more generous. Yeah, so I look like the stingy one again. Not at all. Not at all. Oh, and now if you would like, like analysing, you say that the, God, oh, the, the <laughs> yeah. pitch shift would suggest that there was, a, there was a little bit of, you know. It's yeah. a genuine score, a genuine a, five. A genuine five, not a solid eight, it's a genuine five. Or a nice nine even that I was giving out in season two, as you recall. Mm. It's a nice nine. Yeah. It's not a nice nine though, this is not a nice nine. Well, it might be in total. <laughs> 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 yes, I, I, um, um, I, I don't, I, I am, I'm going to go with James. I don't think it quite gets to average, and it's not so awful that you can't watch it. So again, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of a pain to say it's not, it's not something where I physically have to turn the telly off. But actually, if it's on the television. I don't feel the need to pause it or go, I'm really into this and I love this. I kind of think I could go out in the garden for an hour and a half and come back in and see how it's getting on. Um, so I have given Doctor Who and the Ark with a C of Infinity four. Mm. Yeah. Which gives it in total 13 points. That could be our season leader. No, they, they, I'm, I'm, I, I don't. I can't recall far enough back, but I think that's not far off what the Space Museum was 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 clocking in at. Space Museum might have got a bit more than that. I think the Space mm. Museum did get more than that. <laughs> we refer the Morrocks. Bring back the Morrocks. They didn't do that for the 20th anniversary, did they? 
I think it would have helped it if they had if they brought the Morox back. If you ask Russ next time you see yeah. him, hey Russ, can you bring them back for the 60th? We'll have the quarks back for the 60th. I'm already working on it. Good. I should hope so. Well, it is the Bezzy mates with Russ. Anyway, we are moving on to the second story of season 20. It's only the second story. It is Doctor Who and the Snake Dance. Go on. Who, who's up and out this one, then? Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a little stab at this one um, to start us off with. So, um, obviously, another returning um, uh foe here if you like for this story um and we get the sequel to um kinder insofar as the mara are back and um tegan's having some bad dreams so it's a good job she rejoined the tardis crew at the end of the arc of infinity because we get to go away and explore why she's having bad dreams and obviously this leads to another confrontation with that with that great snake um and Again, I think this is uh, an interesting inclusion in this season because to bring the Mara back, um, I thought the story was quite nicely wrapped up at the end of the first uh, iteration of this in Kinder. So to bring it back, um, it's probably surprising, but nevertheless, you know, why not investigate this and, and take a look at it? I think the script uh, is, is quite carefully crafted and I kind of I like it. Um, and it gives Tegan some really good action for her first story back. Um, we get a very young Martin Clunes, so that's something to talk about later, I'm sure. Um, but again, it's not quite a classic, and I think this story's misfiring a little bit as well as it comes through. And I think that, unfortunately for me, becomes a bit of a um, a bit of a trait for this season. But uh, I'll be interested to hear what the others say. I think you said it all. No, <laughs> no, it is, it is, it is convenient that uh, that Tegan is back just as she's having these bad nightmares, and uh, and we get the sequel to Kinder that everybody wanted. You know, I remember thinking, sitting there going, "That's the sequel I wanted. I wanted the snake back." Uh, this time without the uh, you know animatronic old lady, but um, <laughs> so we get Martin Clunes instead. <laughs> Barry day. Morris was like, I can't do it, lovey, I can't do it, I'm busy, got summer season. <laughs> she got um, Fraggle Rock, she was like, I can't come back. Jim Henson wants me to do something else. What I love when I was researching this is that Martin Clunes doesn't like to talk about it because it used to be the, the one that they would always show the clip of him looking really camp with the earring or the, you know, the headdress on. Whenever he went on a talk show, they would go, oh, do you remember when your first acting role is in Doctor Who? And he's just like, oh, no. <laughs> no, I wouldn't mind, but I've been watching No Place Like Home on Forces TV. He should be much more ashamed of that, to be brutally frank. I, th I think you're right. I mean, this this is, I mean, you know, this is Janet's big moment, isn't it? Because the rest of the cast kind of take a, a back seat while she becomes possessed by, by the Mara again. And, you know, lots of overacting Panto villain style, you know, with the snake in her hand and things. And I think in some respects, that's, it's quite nice to see her have that, you know, to see her uh, take take centre stage. And, you know, now she's she's back. But we just saw in the previous episode, we just saw a much stronger Nissa. We saw a much better relationship with the uh, with the Doctor, and now Deacon's back. And she's like, you know, the Doc blocker, really, isn't she? She's just like, I am going to. Look at Jason's face. <laughs> you know, he has a perfectly nice relationship. I'm just going to slap bang in the middle of it. Um, and, and, and really, it's quite sad to see that happen. I mean, I know the Doctor and Nyssa are kind of, you know, together during this and spend quite a lot of time in prison, you know, um, or, or the Doctor's sort of meditating with a little crystal. And it, and again, this has got quite a good cast as well. Yeah, you know, I quite like some of the other characters, but it 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 just kind of meanders its way. And 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 they were going to 
I mean, I, um, the writer, I've got it written, Christopher Bailey, isn't it? He, he was commissioned to do a third story, which, which you know, didn't get onto the TV series. So there, there was a plan for a, for a trilogy. But like you say, at the, the end of the first one, it was kind of like done and dusted. It was Monster of the Week it's been defeated by mirrors and, and you know and, and now we have the snake back and there's that whole scene where um tegan is in front of the mirror laughing at it because you know it, it's more powerful this time round. and so yeah it is i don't know I, I i mean you will recall i loved kinder i gave kinder a 10 when we did the scoring because i i love all the obscure references and things like that but I, I I feel here a bit like the previous story we're we're just doing a sequel for the sake of doing a sequel it is you know 20th season we want lots of callbacks what was a really good you know unusual story kinder oh you know we got Tegan back let's do another Mara story so I, I think the interesting thing I would take from what they sh what I think would have been better with Snake Dance is that Kinder, um, Nissa has off basically, doesn't she? Because she needs yeah. the two weeks of the contract. But she sleeps through Kinder. So if the Mara had escaped by any means from that story, if he'd have escaped in Nissa's dreaming, yeah. Nissa was the one that was taken over in this story. It would have been so much more impactful. And I, it comes back to the, the problem problem I have with Kinder itself is that Tegan is so aggressive and unlikable if she's possessed by something that makes her nasty she just becomes nasty aggressive and unlikable there isn't a shift in her character that that makes her any different to how she is regularly it just means she's you know actually killing people rather than just staring at them whereas if Nyssa who's meant to be like from this pacifist kind of culture of, of harmony, you know, Trug is this harmonious, beautiful sort of place. If her character suddenly went red-eyed and started killing people and laughing, that's such a U-turn on what she is. Tegan is 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 unpleasant and, and, and she's just more unpleasant with it. So I just kind of think that the shift isn't isn't a big enough twist on it. And and I think that's where it, it fails for me. She can obviously do the nasty part, but it's it's not it's not a big enough contrast to what she is normally, you know. Especially as Nissa was more sort of gung ho in the last story, you could have fed that into this that that she's slowly starting to succumb to the Mara in her subconscious, and but the problem is though. The problem is, though, James, sorry to cut across there. Um, no, the, pro the problem there is, though, that that wasn't necessarily, as you said uh, in your review of the last story, wasn't actually technically written for him, potentially. Yes. And that that necessarily isn't a strand that they were heading down this season because, you know, essentially we're, we're moving towards, uh, without giving any spoilers here, we're moving towards um, her leaving the series. So um, I'm not entirely convinced that there was a global grand plan, but I actually love that. That, that concept you've come up with there, P-Bell, that if you had done it in that way, I think you're right, it would have had so much more impact. You could have built it up over a few episodes, whereas really we're presented with it from the get-go, right in the first scene, oh, I'm yeah. having bad dreams, and you know, and it pretty much it's there, and, we're, pre and we're, we're then trying to do something about it. And somehow, you know, Tegan has managed to manipulate the controls um, by giving the doctor the coordinates to land right in the middle of where she needs to be. It all just feels very um, manufactured. I like the idea that just, you know, a personal stereo is going to go keep the Mara away. It's just like... It's, it's like listening to it at the gym and you take it off and you can hear what they're actually playing in there. And it's like, oh, my mind. I think, I think it's the same sort of setup. <coughs> but it, it does... That, that's one of those sort of cheap things. And I think this slightly hits that thing we, we find often with a, a studio story, isn't it? Where it, it, it does all kind of look like the local Amdram set, doesn't it? It's all kind of flat. The, the, the film stuff looks beautiful, as, as is ever the way with the Doctor Who. When you get the film bits, at Ealing and the real snake, that looks gorgeous. Um, the, the sets look as if they maybe spent money on an extra night in Amsterdam and 
yeah really feel that slack like, yeah i agree and i think if you if you look i mean obviously again we're being picky about the sets here but you know you've got an awful lot of rock and stone there but unfortunately there's steps wooden steps leading up to all of it and you can't hide that uh, very easily when you're filming in studio in that way so you're right i think it feels a little bit um claustrophobic almost i mean some of the the um, market scenes work quite well in studio but i think it's when you get into caves and and you know uh it's obviously wood um and it isn't working that well because unfortunately the actors are not able to walk that quietly up those stairs that are supposed to be stone carved i mean having had great caves in earth shock it can be done it's it's not like it, it's 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 a, a, an impossibility it's it's um, I mean, I was going to say on the last video, I do slightly wonder whether Earthshock is the turning point for Doctor Who insofar as it was such a success and such a hit that did that become the trigger point for things from the past of what we need to work with? I don't know whether, is, is that, is the success of Earthshock, is that what's the biggest influence on this season and sort of going forward, this mm. kind of thing of pulling stuff from the past? Potentially, and I think you know it was obviously done. It was done well. You know the the, the surprise return of the Cybermen and the you know, the redesign worked really, really well. So you know it goes back to what I said about Arc of Infinity. You know you bring Omega back, but you bring Omega back in a way that engages the audience. And there's some recognisable bits there for the for the older viewer who potentially would have watched it back in the beginning. But you're right, it becomes a bit of an MO um, for JNT that now pretty much we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna trade quite heavily on the past. And actually that that for me spells that potentially there wasn't that much original ideas that were coming in at that point, maybe enough to drive original stories um, rather than relying on on bringing old, old, old concepts back to the fore. I think um, Snake Dance has got three outstanding performances that I'm going to pull out. Uh, I think Colette is yeah. beautifully classy mm -hmm. and she's absolutely on the right pitch. And I, I, I love all of her scenes. I love how she rolls. John Carson is always amazing. I don't think I've seen John Carson be anything less than amazing in anything he's done. You know, whether it's sort of a hammer horror, where it's just, just, you know, so much nonsense. And he's still, he's got that sort of, I think he's got that Peter Cushing quality of, of always being a sort of rock of quality, no matter what he's in. It, it, and that sounds a bit, bit derogatory, but it's, it's not meant to be in terms of, it doesn't matter if you're in the saint or whatever, if you're in there, you're, you're still giving it your absolute, you know, honesty. And I think he's tremendous in this. I love John Carson. And Brian Miller, who, who has quite a thankless part to some extent, but he's, he's, he does such a great time with it. And there's, there's lots of light and shade to it, and, and it's quite a horrible ending for him. Um, so I really, I really think he he's got a, a, he does a great turn. And I think he's sort of un, 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 unspoken. I don't think people necessarily pull him out because there is, I think people always do. It's Jonathan Morris and Brad and Martin Clunes has got earrings, and I think that's probably what where people go <laughs> straight away with these things. But I think, I think, um, yeah, Brian Miller, I think needs a, a bigger shout out for, yeah. for his turn. Funnily enough, I wrote the, the same three names down because I feel exactly the same. The scene where Ambrose got the 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 mar, you know, the, the thing on his head, and he's like, you know, these are the six faces, and he's like, but there must be some problem because there's five faces, and he, he's just like, you know, trying to indicate very subtly that's the sixth one. He he does have. You know, he's got comedy timing, but he's also got that sort of thing about him where uh, later on when they're in the caves and Martin Clunes is like smashing all these sort of like priceless relics. And he's just, you know, he's like, oh, my God, you know, you can't do that. He, he just every scene that he's in, I mean, he must have read the script and gone, what is this? But he just goes out and, and, and delivers and, and I think, you know, that what, that's what keeps this story going because you, you've got, you know, some great cast members, but then you've got others that are literally chewing the scenery. I mean, I, I mean, I know this is Martin's debut, but he is incredibly camp. You know, he just seems to be, 
you know, and he is, he is a good actor. I've seen him in stuff and I really enjoy him, but he, here he looks like he's just come out of theatre school and, you know, and, he, and, and in his head, he's still got his, you know, his theatre studies, you know, teacher going, just give it large, darling, go, go, go large, like this. And he's just like, you know, I've got to, I've got to camp it up, uh, you know, just dial it up to 10 for this show. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Jonathan Morris doesn't, apart from just being the the, the scholar, if you like, he didn't do a great deal. He, he's just there and you just go, he's the guy from Bread. But he doesn't, there's nothing, I'm not saying he's bad in this at all, but he, he's, he kind of falls in between the, you know, really great acting and the really overacting. It's quite a fall. generic character, though, isn't it, James? I think. Yeah, it there, could be he's there, to, he's there to help, but he's quite generic, and it's not. I don't think it's his fault necessarily. I think the character's written quite generically. Yeah, I think one of my favourite points actually is it, it, it actually you get a little bit, don't you, where um, where where the doctor helps Nessa down, and she's quite unnecessary. I think that's probably yeah. one of my favourite parts in the whole story. And and Jonathan Morris is there for that. That's what we think about. He's 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 there for that to just 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 go. But um. Yeah, it it he it's a slightly thankless part. I think I agree. It, it, it there's not lovely curly hair though. I mean, I, I love those oh, yeah. those locks. Um, and he's also there for the cliffhanger. Nissa gives like literally. I mean, I don't think she she does it before or after. But she gives the biggest badass scream when they're about to get killed when they go, when they when they draw the swords out. I don't know. That comes. I don't know whether they just told her that that terminus and she's off. But there's a right old scream there, and, I, and that that that's one of those sort of you know, proper end of episode belts that you don't get very often. She even gets a new outfit for this uh, this story, doesn't she? It's the start of her changing outfit several times during this yeah. season. So she has it's, the it's like, additional chalk and brown on for Arc of Infinity, and then we're into a new. And she's and she's desperately wanting the Doctor to see this new outfit at the beginning of the story as well, and he's not really paying any attention, no. which is a little bit of comedy um, timing um, there. I think Peter was quite was did an interview where he said all the you know a lot of the costumes are awful in this. Uh, I mean <laughs> Martin Clunes, you know when they do the ceremony and he's dressed up like the the sun god or whatever it is, <laughs> with the big red gloves I, on, right yeah, up with to the his big arms red there. Gloves on as well, I mean, you know. He's got to cover his snake up, in he? he can't can't be showing off his snake, can he? I know, but you know, dear viewer, I, think, I was going to cosplay, but I just couldn't dress like that. <laughs> <laughs> However, he has got a ninety ready for terminus. That's all I'm saying. Oh my days! No, I hope not. <laughs> um, you're right though about Martin Clunes. I think you are right, James. He's approaching this. He's he's fresh out of um, he's fresh out of acting school, isn't he? And there's a real sort of almost a, a bratty sort of. Um, impotence to his, his approach here he's sort of like he's, he's quite stroppy and it kind of doesn't work he's kind of overdoing it and it kind of it just doesn't sit well with the with I think the character that it should have been hmm. I don't I, I quite like it. I think he I think he's 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 he possibly a little over but I think I think he's he works I think I think it's it's, it's well counterpointed by Colette being very yeah. sort of purring and very very understated, I think I think that helps. So I think I think I think he, it works. He is meant he is meant to be an, a, a brat and unlikable and all that stuff. So I think he's it's, a stroppy stroppy teenager, isn't he? It's, yeah, I think I think I think I think, he's, I think, he, I think he does all right. He yeah, hopefully got some other stuff afterwards. I think. <laughs> I agree about the interplay between them both. Though I think on screen they work really well together. So do we have any exotic facts on Doctor Who and the Dance of the Snake? So, um, that, yeah, we're talking about callbacks to previous seasons. So there is a reminder that uh, the sonic screwdriver was destroyed during the visitation. Um, there was another one, and I can't see it. Um, no. Oh, um, there was a... There was a Peter was called to a photo shoot uh, and then turned up and found um, Matthew Waterhouse was there in costume along with um, Janet and um, 
the, 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 all three of them were there. And it was, so this is your life. He got surprised with this is your life during the filming of this story. I thought you were going to say Matthew just wouldn't leave. I was going to be like, oh, God, that's so sad. <laughs> JNT was like, guess what? I brought another companion back. <laughs> it's like, like Peter went to like, go a photo shoot for Snake Dance. He was in costumes. Does he not know yeah, if he went? That's embarrassing. Does, he, does, went. He, does he not remember he's been he's on the show? Uh, but that that was that was it. Oh, the production overran. So the, the so the scene in the next story where the doctor is comforting Tegan was actually filmed at the back end of this story, but they had to cut it because they were over. That's it. Right. That dark web is delivering today, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that, that was shady, Clifford. That was shady. No, I love it. I love this segment of the of the uh, of the instalments. <laughs> Get him giggling away. Honestly, he just needs a fan, doesn't he? Right. <clears throat> I think it's I, I think it's time for some scores for the snake dance. I do. <laughs> yes, indeed, it is time for some scores and. Uh, uh, so as it doesn't look like I'm uh, parroting your scores there, James, I'll, I'll fly first on this one. So um, it's not... Um... <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just give it one point higher than Jason. I don't care what he scores now. I'm just going to go... Oh, no. what I, you won't be able to if I give it a 10, James. <laughs> God, I dare you. <laughs> but it's very unlikely I'm giving it a 10. So let's be totally honest here. Um, OK, so the, the, we, we continue the trend as we come into this one. I think there are some good points. Um, to be had in this story. Um, I agree and think the same myself. Did Kinder really need a sequel? And this feels like we're just rehashing some, some old ideas here just because, again, it's the 20th anniversary season and we want to hark back and do some things to bring back um, previous encounters that the Doctor might have had. So um, I, I think it's not as good as Kinder, I'll be perfectly honest. I think I scored Kinder seven. I think when we when we did that review, um, and Kinder wasn't yes. a favorite. Kinder wasn't a favorite of mine the first season anyway. So, um, uh, so you know, this one was going to have to work quite hard. Um, Rewatching it again, it's not one I've watched recently. Um, I think it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit restricted by the studio. I think the sets aren't particularly good. I think there are some good performances, and you've highlighted all of those through the course of this. But again, it just feels just a little bit like mm, it's just it's still stuttering this season, hasn't quite got off to a, a, a the strong start that I would really want for the 20th anniversary season, if I'm honest. Um, so all things being equal, um, it's not as bad as Ark of Infinity, but it's certainly not as good as Kinder was. And I'm scoring Snake Down six. What, what's a six then? A uh, uh, slinky six? It's it's I, I I can't give it anything to go with it. It's just a plain old six because it feels plain old. Just because this season's not doing it for me yet. So what that was plain old Jason score. <laughs> That's what James got to say for it. <laughs> well, I hate to say this, but I am actually in agreement with Jason uh, on the scoring front. So I, you know, I did give this a six. I think. It, it's rescued by some really good performances, not really by the main cast. Normally we're like, oh, the main cast is on fire and, you know, whatever else around them. In, in this instance, the Doctor and Nyssa are sidelined. Yes, you know, Tegan gets her moment of, you know, playing panto villain, but I, I think it's the, the rest of the cast that actually lifted a little bit for me. Um, and I loved Kinder, you know, and all the different ideas and, and, and thoughts behind it. This just is a shadow of that. So, I, you know, it's better than the last story, but only just. So it gets a six from me. So <laughs> in, in, in keeping with the current trend, um, I awarded Doctor Who and the Snake Dance five, which is one point more than I gave to Ark of Infinity. <laughs> it's it's fine. It's it's I again. It's, I, I don't I don't sit there and hate it. I, I, I it's it's sort of average. It's all right. I 
I say I like the, the three forms I thought I especially like in this, but again, I think that's not really enough within the schematic of it's a four part story. You, I, I want a story that I, I engage with or I enjoy, or I, there's just so many elements to this that are either missing or not quite good enough for me that I, I it's not one I, I, I rush to put on. Yeah. I mean, I don't rush to put on all of them. I mean, I'm not, not like I get out of this and I like get the fish fingers in the oven and I got to rush to put Doctor Who on. But there, there are some stories that if, if you're sat there and you think, you know, I want to watch Doctor Who, you'll put the Sea Devils on. You know, I never sit there and think, oh, dance. It, it's just not, I, I, I sort of watch it when I have to watch it for whatever context I've got to watch it. So, and not because it's awful, it's just not one that I'm particularly thrilled by. So a five, I think, is a fair score for me. If you disagree, write it below and I'll get you moderated. <laughs> I'm joking. That's not, that's, that's not a true thing. That's what Jason does. No, I don't. <laughs> Jason just asks for phone numbers in the comments below. Oh, that's just rude. Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag tragic, tragic. Um, which gives snake dance... It, it's our season leader because it's now got 17 points. So if something in this season can hit the big 2-0, it's going to take it, I think. Um, well, anyway, that was the, that's the end of part one of season 20. Um, so thank you very much, guys. Pleasure, as always. Thank you. Yes, great. So you can join the um, the three faces of delusion again for part two. So like, subscribe. Oh,